2001, I was in a, a bad car accident. Up until that time, I was motivated. I was really, I loved living, um, but I, I don't feel like I had a whole lot of focus. And, um, you know, this tragedy that happened, um, a friend of mine passed and uh, it was a really difficult time to go through. But um, in the long run, I think it really focused me. And uh, it made me think about today. I got to seize today. I thought that I was the next one to go. So I felt like I really had to take advantage of the time that I had. And that made me learn how to paraglide. It made me try things skiing. It made me try, you know, meet more people, go different places. You know, I get a little choked up talking about it because it was a really difficult time, but it really did teach me a lot and made me appreciate life. Hi, I'm Chris Whiteout. Welcome to Living It, the podcast where we join experts in the experience of being human. Be bold. Say yes to adventure. Say yes to living it. Welcome to Chris Whiteout, Living It, where we talk with experts in the experience of being human. My guest today is Ben Eaton, who most assuredly qualifies as an expert in the experience of being human. I remember at your wedding, Benny, that your brother Ace said, I just wish that I could live Ben's life. Something to that effect. He's an iron sculptor. He's a big mountain backcountry skier. He is a paraglider. He lives in Crested Butte, Colorado. He is one of the happiest guys that I've met, and, and he does some super cool stuff. Benny, thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Now, we have to go a little bit back because we were roommates in Vail, Colorado in, what was this, 95, 96, right? Yes. And you had just moved out, like just graduated from college, right? And just moved out? Is yes. How it I graduated from St. Lawrence University in 94. Um, moved there um, that fall. Uh, my buddy Jonas, John Simosferos. <laughs> and um, that's when I, I are obviously already knew you, but I didn't really know Sarah and um, got to move in with you guys. It's great. Yeah, that was awesome. Now, I want to remember, because the thing is, that's where your, that's where your iron sculpting started, right? Yes. And, and I always love this story. How did you, how did you find a way to be an iron sculptor? <laughs> well, um, at St. Lawrence, I was a fine arts major. So I did a lot of sculpture, um, but m most of them large size sculptures, they would take months to do and um, be really expensive. And um, once I was done with them, I'd be really proud of the finished um, product. Um, I'd have these huge things that then I would have to try to find a home for. Um, so um, I decided uh, to focus my energies into uh, uh, ironwork and um, something that, um, sculpture that is actually usable. So, pardon me. Um, so I, um, was doing a menial job when I moved to Vail and um, decided uh, that I really wanted to find somebody in the Vail Valley that worked in steel and um, optimally a, a blacksmith. So um, I was doing a temp job at the time. A blacksmith. Okay. Yeah. So, so for the rest of us, we think of a blacksmith as some, some gigantic guy with like huge forearms and an anvil who is, who is making horseshoes. Yes, <laughs> that is the stereotype, yes. What, what is a blacksmith? What does that mean? Um, well, it's an iron worker, but um, typically an ornamental blacksmith is um, someone who worked in iron um, before technology um, came in where you were able to um, use electricity for welding and um, use um, all kinds of high tech um, machinery to come to your, um, your final product where blacksmithing kind of takes it back um, a bunch of years. And um, we 
still um, use heat to create our final product. So um, I forge the metal rather than cutting and welding it together. So, um, so you forge it, meaning that, that, I mean, like what kind of heat are you talking about when you have to get, because you have to get this to a molten state or to a, or I, I don't Not know. Not quite molten, but it's really close. It's um, typically a, um, you, you can tell the heat of the metal by the color of the metal. And um, so a, a high yellow is optimal for forging. You can actually move the metal around on your anvil and in your trip hammer um, and form it with your, with your hammers to make whatever you want. Um, so that's about 2,800 degrees. And um, it starts um, sparkling and falling apart at about 3,000 to 3,200 degrees. So, so what's super a hot? Do you have to, do you have to stoke this? Are you like building a fire every day or? Um, traditionally a coal forge, you do have to um, stoke and work. And that is a major portion of the process is um, being able to tend your fire and to, um, to make it a um, really efficient um, burning fire. Um, I do use a propane forge though. I have three different propane forges. I have a coal forge and I use it every once in a while, but, um, you know, it, it's a lot more efficient, cleaner, safer to use propane. Um, so that's what, that's what most blacksmiths do today. Um, it's best to learn how to blacksmith with a coal forge. And then um, once you know how to use that coal forge and you can appreciate how hard it is, then you can go and use propane. Because the thing is with the coal forge, one, you're building a fire and you're trying to get a consistent heat, but two, you're doing your work in addition to stoking your fire to making sure that it maintains a consistency. Is that, is yeah. that yeah. part of the, the multitasking is the issue there? Yes, and, and it's a dance and it's a, um, a beautiful dance when you watch somebody who really knows what they're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's working the iron and then as you said, um, being able to control your fire. It's not just like a wood fire where um, you just throw a log on it and it's good for the next 20 minutes or, or half hour or whatever. You, um, with the coal uh, forge, you're, you're starting with coal but you're creating coke um which is uh, an off product of um burning the impurities off the coal and you have this coke which is um it's like a, a popcorn uh, almost substance and that is um where you really get a lot of your um high-end fuel to get your fire hot enough to get it up to that three thousand degrees that you you need for um, for forge welding or for a lot of the different um, things that you might do. Um, you know, there's so many. Wow. Okay. So this is, so a blacksmith is somebody who's creating this, who, who's working with the forge, who's getting this almost molten metal. And then, yeah. and then you have it on your, on your anvil. And you said you had a, a trip hammer. What's a trip hammer? A trip hammer on um, my, a trip hammer is a 50 pound little giant trip hammer made in 1927. And um, the you're like Thor. Cast, sorry? You're like Thor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, not exactly. But um, yeah, it, it's a um, really cool machine that does a lot of my heavy pounding. So um, you start off with a bar of steel, whatever you want to make, um, you know, say I'm making um, a lot of tapers. So I'm creating points on the end of um, a bar. And um, to really move that metal, to stretch it out, you need to um, make the most of the first 10 or 15 seconds after you pull it out of the fire. So when it's at that 28, 2700 degrees and really move the metal. And then as it cools, um, you're planishing the metal, but you're, you have, you've stopped actually changing um, the dimensions of it. So, so um, 
to optimize that first 10, 15 seconds, you have this machine called Trip Hammer. And it, um, it um, has three blows a second at full power. It's three blows a second with 50 pound RAM. So it would be like if I could swing my hammer three times a second with a 50 pound hammer on, uh, that I'm holding on to. So it's able to actually move the metal and do um, the work of um, multiple smiths within seconds. Wow. Okay. So this is, so, and then, and so then you're creating shapes and, and, and you're also creating bonds as well, right? Is that part of it where you're, where you're bonding one metal to another kind of thing? Or one yes. piece to yeah. another piece. Yep. Um, forge welding is when you have two pieces that that are right there at that sparkling temperature, and you're able to um, throw some flux in between them, and then um, some flux. Them What's together. flux? What's flux? Uh, flux. Flux is um, a substance, kind of like sugar that you put in onto the point where you want the two pieces welded together. And um, it keeps oxygen from getting into the weld. So it creates an oxygen free en environment for that weld to happen. If you had air bubbles, um, then the weld would be bad, wouldn't, wouldn't stay together. So you need to have a little flux in there. You need to be really quick. You have to know where, where to hit. And then um, when, the, when the steel is still hot, you gotta have two pieces, they're exact same temperature. And, um, and then you hammer them together. And that's a forge weld. Um, I use a lot of other joinery techniques, um, riveting, bending, twisting, um, using large pieces of metal and, and um, bending them together rather than trying to actually join them together. So, and I, I have a modern welder as well. So um, when I need to, I can weld it together and then um, I, so that it actually keeps the steel together and then go ahead and forge weld. It's, you know, a, a little bit of um, a shortcut. There's mm -hmm. lots of little shortcuts you can do. Well, this is, but, but part of it is you're doing it for, for, for the purpose, right? And, and the purpose it sounds like is, cause a lot of the stuff you do is, is functional, right? Where it's, yes. where it's yes. banisters and railings and those kinds of things, fences and stairways and all that kind of stuff. But then, so functional in that respect, but then also functional in terms of the artistic part of it too, right? You have a vision for what you want to create and how you want it to look. And so you have many tools, some of yes. which you create as yeah. well, right? A lot of them which I create and a lot of them are antiques. So, um, and then some of them are, are new, but um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's always a challenge because um, to every project is slightly different. Um, so every day is a little bit different and it, it keeps it exciting and you always have um, problems to solve. And, you know, there's a, a lot of different ways to do the same thing. So um, what I try to do is um, have my artistic flair in, in functional artwork and, um, I've been able to um, make a business out of it for, gosh, it's gone on 27 years now wow. that I've been doing this. Well, let's let's go back to the beginning before we get to that, because I want to figure out how you make this into a business. But first, I want to figure out how you got started. So so we were living in the same house in Vail. And as I remember it, and tell me if I'm wrong, you picked up when we used to have a phone book. <laughs> remember yeah. that thing it was a phone book it was kind of <laughs> and you picked up yep. the, is, is that how this worked that you picked up the phone book and and tried to find somebody who is who was a blacksmith that's exactly right yeah i looked up blacksmithing in the yellow pages <laughs> and um there was one listing um for iron creations in west vale um this guy named steve zoracek and um, you know, I, uh, I was in the middle, I was on, having lunch break from this menial job where I was digging a ditch or something. <laughs> and I gave um, the blacksmith a, a buzz and um, he was super nice. And I kind of gave him my background a little bit over the phone. And then he uh, said, 
well, if you get here in 10 minutes, you got a job. So um, was there something I, about getting struck by lightning the week before or something too? Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, he had um, he'd been standing outside his shop holding on to some steel and he was standing in a puddle and um, uh, some lightning struck about a quarter mile away and uh, worked its way down a telephone line and then grounded out to him and um, he burned the um, the skin right off the bottoms of his feet and um, he was pretty frazzled for quite a while and this was only about two months after that incident had happened and he needed another set of hands because he had a, a full slate of work to do and he wasn't really able to do it so for the next three years I was his hands essentially and um, you know, he was able to do some stuff um, but for the most part, um, he would sit in the shop and tell me what to do and how to do it and um, throw in a lot of colorful, colorful stories along the way. We called him Story Check, um, and he was a wonderful, extremely intelligent mentor to have for, for three years. So it allowed me to learn the profession, and um, I was really fortunate. Which, which in a lot of ways, this was just an ideal situation for you learning at the, at the feet of this guy who had, who had done so much. Can you describe Steve, though? I mean, you got you to you paint a picture of who okay. Steve is or was. Well, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But um, Steve Zorichek, um, he went to the Colorado School of Mines and... Um, he, you know, obviously Coors Brewery is right there in Golden, Colorado. Um, so right after school, um, he graduated uh, for the School of Mines, I think it was in 58. So it kind of gives you an idea of his age. And um, he started working for Coors Brewery and they were they were just really um, expanding the brewery at that time. And uh, um, he had this amazing, um, ability to, um, have, uh, tons of information in his brain. And he was, um, a metallurgist and an engineer. And, um, he basically engineered all of the, the piping for, um, for the largest brewery in the world. Um, if you've ever taken a look at um, Coors Brewery, there's, there's a lot of Anheuser-Busch breweries and they make more beer, but Coors only has that one brewery and um, it's massive. And um, he spent, I think, 10 years um, working on how to get all the... Um, all the beer from one end of the building for to the other and you know all the ins and outs of brewing beer and uh pretty fascinating um process of you know he was working um directly on the same desk directly across the desk from um from one of the cores boys and um they really um made that into a, from a mom and pop brewery into what it is today um, but he um, worked for Coors for, um, I think it was about 20 years, and he did a bunch of different things through the, um, the oil and, and gas shortage in the 70s. He um, revamped the whole brewery and um, was able to um, move them into the next uh, decade of um, brewing. But one of the things that he did as a brewmaster was he... Um, came up with a recipe for Coors Light, um, which is one of the uh, most consumed beers in the world. It's obviously very um, notorious. And um, he also came up with the recipe for ice beer. Um, so he had all these little pet projects that he was working on. And um, in the mid 70s, he had a bit of a uh, a nervous breakdown and he decided that he didn't want to be an engineer anymore. He wanted to um, go to his little ski chalet up in Vail, Colorado and um, become a blacksmith. 
And this is literally a a wood a a, a log cabin. Well, pretty much. Or was that actually, a different one? It was a slightly different. That has a little story to it as well. Um, and I'll try to be kind of quick with it, but um, ski instructors built his very shoddy home on Forest Road, ski in, ski out Vale in 1962, which I believe is like the second year Vale was open. I think it did it open in 60 or 61, something like that. But yeah, um, sure. very early on in Vale, um, he had ski in, ski out property. And on forest he, on forest road which is on, like the yeah. most spectacular property in vail right as as good as it gets yeah yeah <laughs> wow. so um he um over the period of 20 years again he um he took this this little shack up on forest road and it, it the wind blew through it so he took a um railroad depot and from up in Leadville and took it apart. He bought the railroad depot for a dollar. He uh, moved it to Vail piece by piece and um, put insulation on the inside of his house and then redoubled his walls and built the um, railroad depot inside his house. So um, it was board by, for board exactly the way it had been through the 1800s it, you know it was an amazing um room to be in um but um ross perot bought the the uh land next door to him and he ross perot didn't want this shack so he bought um steve out and um I think he gave him like a million dollars for this shack in this eighth, eighth of an acre. And um, Steve moved down to Westvale and he bought three acres and um, was able to move his house, which he'd spent 20 years on this, this old railroad depot. Um, he brought it like four or five miles down the road and put it on top of this massive foundation, which then became his blacksmith shop. Wow, and it was with the three acres he was a he also bought the oldest structure in Vale, which was the old dairy on Elliott Ranch Road, um, down by the old I think it's the Black Bear Lodge. Um, so he had this little compound where he has a blacksmith shop downstairs, um, a railroad depot upstairs, and the historic log cabin right next door. And um, for the three years I, I was there, it was just a constant, um, amazing group of people that would come in and out of there. And, you know, Steve was such a great guy. He had friends all over the world that would just stop in. And um, it was a fantastic way to um, meet people in the Vale Valley and, and learn the blacksmithing trade and learn a lot of other cool stuff from this uh, extremely intelligent dude. Wow. So you, I mean, you studied fine art, you studied sculpture. How much did that prepare you for what you ended up doing as an iron sculptor? Or was Steve really your education in a lot of ways? Well, um, I, th I think that um, my education really helped my art, um, but the technical aspects of building my art, I learned from Steve. Um, I look at a couple um, welding projects that I had done prior to meeting Steve and they're slightly embarrassing as far as, you know, the welds are horrible. It's just technically really bad but artistically not, not so bad at all. So for those people who um, really don't know the technical aspects of blacksmithing, it was fine, but it wasn't as good as it could be. So um, I really uh, worked on the next th three years. I was uh, just did an intensive program with them pretty much every day. I did work for Ski Club Vale as a ski coach in the winters, um, uh, that three or four days a week. And then um, the rest of the time, I was down there in Westvale, pounding on metal. 
pounded on metal. Wow. Yeah. This is, I mean, it's what what an amazing story of just meeting Steve out of the out of the yellow pages. And he's sitting there, like you're pounding metal, and he's sitting there telling you stories and probably drinking Coors Light. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and that's among pretty much your day. Things. Well, it's among other things. That's <laughs> probably true. Yeah. Wow. So so you were there for three years and then and then how did you decide to move to Crested Butte? Did you decide you were going to go out on your own or or how did that work? Yeah, I um, we had gone to a couple blacksmithing conference down conferences down in Carbondale um, the previous two summers. And I had met a bunch of other blacksmiths. Um, one guy that was pretty much the same age as myself and um, John Murphy. And uh, he lived down in um, Powderhorn, Colorado, which is a little bit south of Gunnison. And um, he was trying to put together a shop to start his own business. And, but he didn't have enough tools and he had just started. Um, so um, we decided to put our talents and our tools together and um, we rented this uh, little old shack <laughs> as a shop. And um, we spent the next uh, three years together um, working on iron work um, in Gunnison, Colorado. And uh, that was another really um, great experience. Learned a lot from John Murphy and he's still an excellent friend that I have here uh, in, in Crested Butte, and we still hang out regularly. And eventually you ended up uh, inheriting Steve's forge, didn't you? And like all of his tools and stuff, is that right? Or um, A percentage of them. He had a lot okay. of friends. Um, <laughs> so uh, but I got some really great tools from him and I love being able to just pull them out and use them because it reminds me of him. Um, and uh, maybe the knowledge that I learned when I was using that tool, um, you know, he, uh, the actual forge itself um, went on to his nephews, his okay. sister's boys, um, and they kept a lot of the blacksmithing tools. Okay. And um, so, but between John and I, we were able to um, pull together enough things to um, make it work and then over the years buy a lot more stuff that uh, that made us into a like a reputable blacksmithing studio and you're not you, you and John are still good friends but but you're not partners anymore is that right no or? we're not we we're both very different individuals and so we we both ultimately really wanted our own um, studios, our own say, you know, we didn't really want to have to check in with somebody every time we wanted to um, create something different, you know, different styles. Um, it, it is just, it was the right time for us to both kind of go on to our own things. Now, we're a bit ahead of ourselves in some ways, because we've talked about the technical part of of what you're doing in the forge, we're talking about how you met Steve, how you got involved in it. But how did you get involved in art? How did you decide that you wanted to be an artist? And you know, which is, I mean, you you went to a good school. These kinds of things, it doesn't necessarily point you in the direction of being an artist. Even if you're studying fine art, it's still always a challenge, right? So how did you how did you gravitate toward art? Um. Well, I mean, the, the short answer is right? I, this, right? the short answer is I, sorry. say that again. Sorry. Oh, I was saying your mom's a photographer too, right? Oh, she so, is. Yeah. yeah. My mother's a photographer and she's very, very creative. And um, I loved doing photography. That was my um, second passion at St. Lawrence. I um, spent a lot of time with photography and at Holderness. I, um, I was really into it. I really loved working in the dark room and having that creation be part of the process. Um, so, you know, I really don't do a whole lot of photography anymore um, other than with my phone. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like half the process or maybe three quarters of the process is just gone because we, you know, 
I haven't been in a dark room in 20 years, maybe more. Um, but uh, that was that was certainly a big part of it. But um, I really en um, enjoyed being in the studio and I was pretty good at it. And gosh, it's uh, interesting when when you're good at something and you, you get that feedback, um, you wanna do it more and more and more and it, it kind of feeds on itself. Um, you know, I, I did okay in school. I really um, enjoyed being at, at Holderness. I learned a ton. And then at St. Lawrence, I um, learned a ton and I, I had a great time there, but it was really in um, the art studio that I excelled. And so I decided that, Gosh, that would be crazy if I could actually use my major to learn, to earn a living. Um, and uh, that's what I ended up doing. Yeah, whoever does that, right? Whoever uses yeah. their major to, <laughs> to earn a living. <laughs> I and know. Do, how does this work, though? Do you, do you have a vision of, like, what you want to do, how you want to how you how you want to create something i mean does it start with a vision does it start with a passion does it start with a purpose how, how does that how does that actually happen well it kind of depends on whether or not it's a commission and i'm uh, getting a deposit for it and i have um clients that want a really specific piece um or if i'm doing my own artwork and I can do whatever I want. Um, you know, both are great. I enjoy both a lot. Um, but obviously, um, being able to make a living out of it um, for um, is is really key. So um, first, being able to talk to my clients and see exactly what they want. Um, what the um, the rest of their home looks like, um, what they uh, what type of art that they are really into, and and try to really um, get to know them as people, and then um, I'll mull on it for a while, and um, you know I've had a uh, jacuzzi for about fifteen years, and that's where most of my ideas happen. <laughs> is in the jacuzzi because <laughs> I can just relax and think it through and that's um essentially the way I um I work through my my day my next day's um process while I'm kind of meditating in the jacuzzi which kind of sounds weird but at the same time it's really um so you can write off your jacuzzi then Oh, totally. Yeah. Total tax deduction. <laughs> I got to try that. But um, it's very helpful to be able to, um, everything is, is very much of a step process. So I need to think through the steps. You can't do the sixth step before the second step. You have to go, to go in, in the process. So um, if I can think through my entire um, next day, um, and decide which direction I want to go in. Then when I get to the shop the next day, things just seem to flow. And there's a lot of time, things and times that I have to work out a problem, but um, I've already essentially figured it out in my head what I want it to look like and how big I want it and you know, however um, I want to go with it. Is this all in your head? Or is this, or are you writing this down? I mean, I don't know what you're doing when you're in the jacuzzi, you know? I don't know if you are <laughs> able to write when you're in the jacuzzi or- uh, No, I, I do a lot of drawing and I love to draw full size with um, a soapstone on my table that's five by 10, five feet wide by 10 feet long. So um, it really, to go full size and figure out shapes and sizes and materials, and um and do a lot of sketching as well and um and then it comes down to really the brass tacks of how it's how you're going to build it and what materials you're going to use and where is that starting point because that's really you know the, the hardest part is 
actually starting. Once you start, once you get things rolling, it seems to almost happen by itself. You know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears along the way, but uh, it, it flows. There's, there's a flow state there that I am constantly trying to get in because the artwork's way better if you're not, if you're not just forcing it. You you're need not in to your like, head. Yeah. Let it roll. That's interesting. Now, now, are you up against time constraints because you have, you have this this almost molten metal? Yeah, that's twenty eight hundred degrees, but it cools pretty quickly. And so, so are you kind of you know? I mean, when you think about this, you must be thinking, okay, well, I need to do this, and I only have X amount of time. Yeah. in order to achieve that. So you're, you're fighting the molten metal effectively as you're going or, or, you're, or you're in the flow with the molten metal. Yes, exactly. And, um, and that's another bonus of using propane is I can be working on four or five pieces at once. So I'll have four or five pieces in the, um, in the forge. I'll take the hottest one out work it for um 30 to 45 seconds and put it back in pull the next one out work on that one for 30 to 45 seconds and, you know and then that's just the hot work so i'll do that for say three or four hours a day um and the other three or four hours a day is um tooling for it making jigs for it uh um Lay, layout, um, obviously dealing with clients and paperwork, and um, I'm also the janitor, you know, <laughs> so it got a lot of hats All to hats. wear. Yeah. So I'm I'm not swinging a hammer for eight hours a day, but I I work for about that every day, and um, you know jumping around from one thing to another allows you your body to uh, sustain. Right. To keep it going. Okay, so, so you went and you talked to Steve. You, you said, I want to I wanna be an intern. So, and Steve eventually was paying you, I'm assuming, as well, right? Or not? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> money was probably not the, um, his best uh, thing. <laughs> he really time. had, he had a hard time budgeting for things like that. So I kind of took over that side of things where um, I would uh, create estimates for clients and, um, and try, try to stay on task. But essentially, uh, you would get paid at the end of the project. Um, and um, he was very generous to me. Um, and when he had money, he spend it or give it all away and and it was gone again and <laughs> so then um to eat we would do some trade um with the local restaurant so that we could uh, we went up to this this awesome restaurant the dancing bear for breakfast lunch and dinner we'd fix their um their kitchen appliances and things like that just so that we could for those first couple of years, it was uh, pretty touch and go. I also had a little bit of um, money from um, Ski Club Vale, and I did a little bit of work um, with sharpshooters, uh, taking pictures of people at the top of lifts, things like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that just seems absolutely perfect with Steve, that it's just kind of like, yeah, you get paid when it's done. If I have money, you get paid. And, and yeah, I don't know how much. I don't know. You know. <laughs> we'll see when see how much money we have left when we get there. Well, this is this is such the artist experience too, right? Of like, yeah, you're not getting paid every two weeks. You don't have health insurance. You don't have you don't have a four hundred one k. No. When you went out on your own, how did you make that work? Because then it's not just doing the work. It's not just the forging. It's creating those relationships with the clients. It's getting your work out there so people know who you are. It's the two different kinds of work that you do, right? Where you do, call it, call it more structural kind of work is that, is that versus like the artistic kind of work as well? Um, yes, I, I 
stay away from structural steel as okay. much as I can. Okay. Um, but um, but there certainly are those projects that um, are not artistic. Um, they are, are pretty straightforward. And um, so, you know, you got to do plenty of that to, uh, to get a paycheck as well. And then you get a little bit more jazzed when it comes to something that's more of a challenge and um, something that you can really get your head into. But how did you create those relationships? How did you create the demand for your work, whether it was artistic work, whether it was railings, whether it was stairs, whether it was structural stuff? How did you how did you do that part? Because that's the business, right? You could go to your forge and you could go make stuff all day long. Yeah. Yeah. And and not have anybody buy it, totally. which doesn't seem like a great business. <laughs> no, it's not good at all. I tried that. It does not work. Um, but luckily with blacksmithing, um, you can also work in the construction industry. And so I got in with um, about three or four contractors that uh, used me for fireplace doors. Um, and that would be normally towards the beginning of um, a project. And then hood vents, um, you know, that's more when they're working on the kitchen, get about midway through the projects. And then uh, obviously um, stair railings and, um, and that type of thing. And then once the, the project was pretty close to finished, I also had a relationship with the client that was, you know, buying or building the um, building. And they would then have um, me do furniture or door hardware, or I do a lot of bathroom hardware. Um, and then once that stuff was done and in, lots of the time they'd have me come back to do some artwork for the walls or um, you know maybe something out in front of the house. Um, so that's pretty much how it went for the first 20 years I was in business, something like that. And, and uh, show up at the job site, like initially, did you show up at the job, you see like a house going up and go, hey, uh, I got a forge here. <laughs> I, I, I heat up some metal. Do you guys need any of that kind of stuff? How, how, did that, how does that initial conversation work? Well, it's, first of all, it's Crested Butte's a relatively small town. And right. uh, in the 90s, there was probably... Uh, about six uh, major contractors, construction um, um, teams that would uh, that if you had a, a in with with them, then you know uh, depending on where they were in their project, they'd call you. So if you have a good relationship um, with the different um, people that built the homes, then um, it had a pretty constant flow of work. And if I ever was slow, then I could pick up my own stuff and, and do my own artwork. And, and maybe that would sell, maybe not. But it certainly, even if it didn't sell, it would create um, really good samples. And I could use those for something else in the future. So I could but, kind of build on it. Where, where did you meet these construction people? Did you did did you meet them on the hill? Did you meet them, uh, you know, in the bar? Did you where, where did you meet these guys? Who were, uh, sometimes you would you would actually show up on a site, um, but mostly yeah, usually through either skiing or through the bar or through other friends or. Um, you know, there's a lot of different contacts and not that many people. So um, that wasn't, and the actual meeting wasn't that difficult, but the uh, making them happy and doing um, a product, creating a product that they loved and that um, their clients then um, would rave about. That was my goal, because if, if that happened, then the next job is that much easier. So as long as you get that ball rolling and you uh, prove that you can do whatever project that they might throw at you, um, then you can just kind of keep going with it. So that's pretty much what I did. And I've been doing it consistently um, 
now for almost 27 years um, with the exception of um, there was a nine month stint where my wife um, was getting her master's degree in Europe. And um, I decided to shut down shop and go join her. And um, I thought originally I thought I was going to be going over to Europe and taking an intensive course on, on blacksmithing and going around into the original blacksmiths and, and um, seeing how they did their trade. And uh, so I did go around and I met a lot of blacksmiths. I saw a lot of shops over there in Europe, but I didn't, because of the green card issue, I was not able to work for her. Uh, okay. But, yeah. and, and so, so it's, so it's interesting too, right? Because you're, you're creating a business, as you said, you are, you are everything from the, from the janitor to the accountant, to the, to the artist, to the CEO of this, of this company. You are, you are all of it. But you also found a way to have a full life to, to get out and ski a fair amount. I mean, it's obviously, you know, you can see the mountains right there, right? It's like one of those, like, okay, it looks like we got some new snow last night. Yeah, maybe, maybe we're not going to work today. Maybe I'll go out <laughs> and go ski a little bit. But, uh, but skiing was obviously an early passion for you. And that's how you and I connected was through ski racing. You and my brother, Matt, are the same age. And so our fathers used to, and Ace and I are basically the same age, you know, so our fathers used to hang out on the, on the, uh, on the ski slope and who knows what they talked about, but, but they were, they used to hang out on the ski slope and, but skiing has been a huge part. And, and so then you, you go to Crested Butte and, and you go ski a bunch of different things. I mean, like leaving the Alpine side for the telly side. I mean, I saw you with a gigantic, uh, one of those old time, what, what do you even call it? Like the, like the old time pole, like the big stick that you, uh, a lurch, a lurch. Um, or, and then, they do they call it the telly stick as well there's actually a guy that um, that makes and calls them the telly stick so it's just one big stick you use for a pole instead of two but that was really fun too yeah skiing is has been um the constant through my life that's uh kind of guided me and pushed it pushed me to um to meet great people and see great places and do great things and and um ski racing um, allowed me to have uh, some focus, and um, and I really have everything to thank for uh, for the life that I have. Um, ski racing has been um, the the constant in my life. That's really been wonderful. Well, you went from growing up in Waterville Valley, New Hampshire, yes. which is. I mean, how many how many people lived in Waterville when you grew up in Waterville? The sign said population 199. 199, so just under 200. Yeah, but I think that might have been elevated a bit. That might have been a few of the people that um, had second homes there that were calling that their um, primary residence. Um, but there was, um, when I started there in... in um, elementary school there in 1979 there was I think there was nine kids in school kindergarten through eighth grade <laughs> um the entire school not just each grade it was a one-room schoolhouse um it was uh you know my brother was one of those nine kids <laughs> so um we didn't have a whole lot of team sports let's say that um skiing was it and um, luckily we had the ski, ski area right there and we could get off school and jump on the bus and get to ski pretty much every afternoon in, in the winter. But that bus, because I imagine this was probably your school bus, like that shuttle bus was almost like your school bus of like- It, it was, we didn't have a school bus. None of them, they weren't yellow, they were blue. And um, <laughs> we had a, um, you know, everybody knew everybody. So, um, you know, people looked out for one another and, um, they made sure that, that, uh, after we got done with school, that we were, we were heading to the ski area and then, uh, maybe the lift attendants would keep an eye on us and make sure that we weren't causing too much trouble. But, uh, it was a very unique way to grow up. And, um, you know, luckily, um, 
ski racing was there for us, you know, back East, uh, the, the snow wasn't fantastic. Um, but it really didn't matter for, for ski racing. You know, as long as you had a little bit of ice, you could do what you needed to do. You could exactly. But then you yeah. left Waterville, which to me coming from Massachusetts always seemed like a big mountain, but then you went from Waterville to Crested Butte, which is a gigantic mountain by, 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 by comparison. And so, so wh wh where did you, where did you gravitate? Cause you left the, the chasing the sticks kind of thing of, of ski racing and just yeah. explored the mountain too. Yeah, totally. Well, um, I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to um, keep ski racing and I wanted another challenge. Um, so um, my, my dear friend, Fritz Sample, um, introduced me to telemark skiing and um it that was that was a fantastic new sport i mean obviously most of um the technical aspects of alpine skiing translate directly to telemark skiing but it was slightly um slightly different and um i really really enjoyed it i enjoyed learning something new okay so so Kind of describe, because because some people might not know, describe what telemark skiing is and why it's different and what your progression was. Okay, well, telemark skiing comes from Nordic skiing and, um, and it's actually one of the, the first techniques that people used to get down mountains on skis. Um, it basically, it's uh, ski binding that has no heel piece. Um, so you're free healing it. Um, so you have a different style turn where you pull one ski in front of the other and um, it allows you to still carve a turn and only be really attached to the skis by your toes. Uh, sounds kind of silly, but um, when you see it, it's, um, it's art in motion. Uh, it's a very fluid turn. It feels nice. And, um, and it's, it's difficult. It's, um, I, I'd say it's quite a bit more difficult than standard alpine skiing. So, um, it's, you know, you fall on your face a bunch of times, but you got to get back up and, you know, make it a little bit better every time. And, um, you know, the, that progression um, really made me fall in love with skiing all over again. And it's a workout though, too, right? Oh, man, yeah. It's really, really hard on the thighs. And, um, you know, you're, you're in the middle of this turn and the apex of the turn, and you're basically in a squat position. And, um, yeah, it's uh, after a full run of absorbing bumps and jumping off stuff and you know making really carving turns um your legs are just screaming at you so um it's a great workout and it, are I, you, um, I oop, go ahead uh since then my knees have really not done very well so i've i've gone back to alpine skiing when when i went back to alpine skiing um the technology of of uh, skis had just made this huge advancement. So it was almost like a new thing there as well. So um, being able to jump on fat skis and skis that had really big side cuts was, um, was yeah. another exciting adventure in skiing. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, but that's the cool sport, cool thing, right? I mean, we started skiing at such a young age that, that then to be able to come back to it and recognize the social part, that was the thing for me after, after competing for 15 years or like, you know, effectively professionally for like 15 years and then coming back where, when you're competing, you're sort of worried about getting hurt, doing the stuff that's fun as opposed to the stuff that's actually your job. And then recognizing that, wow, I can do this. I can ski what's fun and I can also enjoy it with other people. I can be with my friends and have a good time, which is I think one of the greatest things about skiing and then also sort of the generational part where 
you know, grandparents can ski with the grandkids and, yeah. and every, all the generations can be together at the same time. Now, were you taking lifts or, or, or are you a hiker? Are you a backcountry? Oh, uh, okay. Um, I definitely took a lot of lifts and I uh, loved skiing in the ski area of, of Crested Butte. Crested Butte was totally new to me when I moved here. And uh, if, for those of you that don't know about Crested Butte, it's known as the extreme mountain. You know, it, uh, it has extremely steep terrain, um, lots of cliffs. Uh, it's very challenging. And um, so again, it just, um, it was something totally different. Vale is, is a fabulous ski area with hundreds of thousands of acres of perfectly groomed terrain. And, but um, it didn't have that kind of rough edge to it. And it didn't have um, trails that, you know, you can't see the bottom of because they're, they're so steep. So um, I um, really enjoyed getting into steep skiing and um, I started doing a little, um, some extreme competitions um, where basically you're judged on uh, your skiing technique and, and your line and uh, you know, what how you, crazy you are, about, how crazy you are, that, <laughs> that type of thing. So that was um, a fun chapter to go through. Sure. When did the flying start? When did you start paragliding? Um, that was when um, I spent that nine months in Europe with my wife in 2004. And um, she was um, busy getting her master's. She did a two-year program in one year. So she didn't um, really have a whole lot of time for me. So um, I, I read a lot of books and right in our backyard, um, we had this uh, mountain called the Celeve. We were right on the border between Switzerland and France okay. and um, right outside of Geneva, Switzerland. So the launch was in France and the landing zone was in Switzerland. So um, you had to go across the border, I think probably like six times a day. Uh, and I just fell in love with it. It was uh, learning, especially learning over there because it's a normal sport over there. There's a lot of people that do it. It's, um, it's not necessarily this horribly risky thing that people think we're crazy for doing in the United States. In Europe, it's just like, oh yeah, let's go for a flight. It's, it's no big deal. It's just, it's just another way to see the planet. And did you just see these guys flying and go, I want to do that? Or how, yeah, yeah. That was it. And I, I hiked up there and um, just kind of hung out on launch and just watched tons of people launching. And then one day, some dude was like, well, I brought my tandem gear, but my wife didn't want to go with me. So I need somebody to go with me. So um, I strapped in with him and the rest is history. I just was like, where do I sign up? How do I buy one of those? I'm in. Fully. How's your French? <laughs> uh, <poo -poo. laughs> yeah. Not so good. But um, I learned enough. I did learn how to paraglide in French, but I don't really speak any French. <laughs> so um, it was a lot of pointing and, and yelling and, uh, and kind of. Yeah. <laughs> It was with, with different. A little bit of with a little bit at stake, though, too, right? Like you know, in French, pointing this and that. But you kind of want to know what you're doing, especially because eventually you're going to be in the air and and sort of have to execute on that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so the first couple times you're actually, you know, riding with somebody else as a um, your tandem passenger, but then they'll give you the, uh, the brakes and let you um, fly the glider. And, um, and then you watching people launch and land. And then there's a, um, a student hill where you actually only get off the ground by maybe 10 feet or something, but you just do launches and landings, launches and landings, launches and landings, and know how to um, control the glider. Uh, understand the rules and understand the weather and um, you know there's so many different aspects to it uh, 
I, I got to, re because I wasn't doing anything and I didn't have a job over there, um, I was the shuttle driver for the really good pilots in the middle of the day when the, when the thermals were going off and it was really difficult flying. Um, and then in the afternoon or in the morning when it's, it's mellower, then I would fly uh, for about the first month or two. And then, you know, kind of ease my way into um, thermal flying and learning how to go up. So once you've kind of, I wouldn't say mastered, but really understand how a paraglider works, your main mission is to look for air that is rising, whether it be um, ridge soaring or thermal flying. And um, so that's kind of your goal is to try to stay up as long as you can and um, look for birds and try to emulate what they're doing. And, uh, and then you can end up staying up for many, many hours and travel long distances. Last summer, I, I, I went 108 miles my paraglider. <laughs> you went 108 miles. Yeah. Wow. From yeah. where to where? Um, Chelan, Washington. Okay. Uh, is a notoriously great place to fly. Okay. And uh, from Chelan, Butte, um, I flew off into uh, the, the wheat fields um, towards Spokane, Washington. And um, there's just one little thermal after another, after another, after another, after another, and creates little cloud streets. And um, you can just, uh, it takes quite a bit of um, know-how and skill, but you can just go forever. The only reason I had to come down is just getting dark and uh, I was in Spokane airspace. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's um, very weather dependent, depends upon the day. You can't just say, oh, I'm gonna go fly for seven hours. It, all the stars have to align and, um, and you have to have, your stuff together and know what you're doing and um it really helps to have really good friends that are also good pilots that uh, um kind of show you where the thermals are and you know, if you go with a group you can see oh my buddy off to the right is catching a thermal and going up right. my buddy to the left is going down i'm gonna go to the right <laughs> so there's a ton of that and um, constantly looking for those thermals. That's interesting. So I was, so 108 miles because I thought I remembered being in Crested Butte and you talking about trying to fly fly to Aspen. Yes. From Crested Butte. Is that, is that sort of one of the goals, which is, which is a lot less, right? That's like 14 miles or something. Yes, like yes. Right. But, but there are, what is it? Like six 14,000 foot peaks in the way. Ah, so that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and so you, um, there are quite a few people that have flown from Aspen to Crested Butte. Um, there have been hang gliders um, that have flown from Crested Butte to Aspen, but nobody has done it on a paraglider yet. Um, so hopefully this summer, <laughs> we'll see. You know, technology keeps getting better. Knowledge is better um you know we just have to be there at the right time the right day and um and really to get over those peaks you have to get up to seventeen thousand feet um so then you can go on glide towards aspen you might lose a few thousand feet hopefully you'll get a few um a few thermals on the way and um get over those fourteen thousand foot peaks is that an issue with the oxygen Part of yes. I mean, you, you get a yeah. lot less oxygen at 17,000 feet, right? Yep, you do. So if you think you're going to, if it's a boomer day and you think you're going to go try for it, you bring supplemental oxygen with you. Because um, you want to kind of have all your faculties. Yes, yes. Right there, right? you definitely do. And, and they tell you that you start um, losing your decision making um, when you get up to around 15,000 feet and you get a little dingy. You do, and especially because you're doing it quickly. If you're riding this thermal, you're yes. going from, I mean, you guys start, you live at, at almost 10,000 feet, right? I mean, 9,000 feet. Well, yeah. you're in Crested Butte South, right? So it might be a little bit lower. 
Yeah, my house is at about 9,000 feet. Okay. And then um, our launch on the ski area is at 11,000 feet. And the peak of the ski area is 12,162 or something like that. Um, and then if you can get above the peak of the Butte, um, there's massive rocks that face west. And um, if you hit it at the right time and those rocks have been um, soaking up energy from the sun all day long, they're going to pop off thermals. So okay. you get over them and then you just you take the elevator up. You take and, the elevator um, up. That is really the magic behind the sport is, you know, the chess game of trying to figure out when to go and when not to go and, and how to, to get in a thermal and how far you should ride it up before it becomes something that you want to get out of. <laughs> Which is awesome. So if you land in Aspen, if you, if you make it, then yeah. how, how long a drive is it back from Aspen to Crested Butte? Because you, you've got to get picked up there, right? Yeah. I mean, 14, 14 miles as the crow flies. Yeah. But it's not that, not that. Yeah, it's, it's like a three hour drive in the summertime when Kebler Pass is open and McClure Pass is open. And then you got to go to Carbondale and then you got to go up to Aspen. So um, yeah, it's a long way around uh, the Continental Divide. How um, long would it take you to, to fly there? Do you know? I mean, it's that, that's one of those. It's really unpredictable, right? I don't know, especially since I haven't done it yet. Good yet. point. Good point. <laughs> Nobody's done. At least two hours, um, but could be more. Could be more. Could now be that more. Um, that yeah. hundred and eight mile flight that I did took me seven and a half hours, I think um of being up there and um because you're not going in a straight that's a 108 miles in a straight line but you're you're going in spirals you're constantly turning and you're trying to go up as high as you can and then you go straight for a while in one direction to get to another and you go up and so um you know if they actually measured your distance that you have traveled it'd be more like 250 miles it's um uh, ridiculous how how far you have to go to get from a point from point a to point b well that's the way it works on on the wind right i mean it's the same yeah. kind of thing with a sailboat or or a, or a, you know that kind of where you're you're tacking back and forth across the and you want to get from here to there but you've got to go left and right and left and right a whole lot of times in order to get there. <laughs> exactly exactly and that's the fun of it if you could just go straight, then there really wouldn't be a sport involved. You'd do it once or twice and be good. Well, other than like downhill skiing, right? I mean, it's the same kind of thing where you just go straight and call it good and go off the jumps and all those things. So, Benny, we, we've talked about we've talked about the art. We've talked about we've talked about skiing. We've talked about flying. Is is there a philosophy? that brings it, that brings this all together, like a pursuit for you? Like what, what, what are you looking for? What, what makes you happy in terms of what you do? Um, well, I, I think, um, mostly it's, it's an attitude and, um, it's a frame of mind that I've tried to get into. Um, uh, 2001, I was in a, a bad car accident. And um, up until that time, I was motivated. I was really, um, I loved living, um, but I, I don't feel like I had a whole lot of focus. And, um, you know, this tragedy that happened, um, a friend of mine passed and uh, it was a really difficult time to go through. But um, in the long run, I think it really focused me and uh, it made me think about, today i gotta seize today and um so since um since the accident i've been able to um you know i i i thought that i was the next one to go i don't i really believed that i was not going to make it to age 50. so i felt like um uh, i really had to take advantage of the time that i had and that made me learn how to paraglide. It made me 
you know, try things skiing and let me try, you know, meet more people, go different places, you know? So, um, you know, I get a little choked up talking about it because it was a really difficult time, but it really did teach me a lot and made me appreciate life. Does that manifest itself in your artwork too, in trying to figure out and taking taking because, I mean, art so much is about achieving a level of honesty and a level of vulnerability and and taking some chances to get there. It, 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 is that part of has it pushed you in that direction as well? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's um, it made me want to take chances. You know, I'm. Um, throughout my life, I've always wanted to do, you know, almost contrary to what uh, the masses wanted to do. You know, I wanted to, I've, I've always enjoyed being in, you know, a niche, a niche profession, being a blacksmith, you know, um, a niche sport, being paragliding. You know, I, I don't want to follow um, the crowds and try to do what other people are doing. I want to do my own thing. And, uh, in doing so, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about, you know, how I want to be and how I want to live. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been a journey. It's, it's still it. And uh, uh, luckily it's uh, been a, a really great journey where um, I've, I've been lucky enough to have a great life, and, um, a great wife. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, generally really happy happy and fulfilled it seems like is that is that fair to say yes yeah being fulfilled is uh you know you have to um be able to look yourself in the mirror and know that um you're you're doing something worthwhile uh that you're not just you know doing the same thing every day you you have to push your boundaries and get to the point where you feel a little bit uncomfortable and, um, and push through that and, and uh, do new things, learn new things. That's, that's, that's what I love about what you're doing, Benny. I mean, you, you've taken the risk to, to do what's, you know, to do what's not traditional, right? Like I'm going to go be a blacksmith, you know, I mean, this is, I'd imagine your college advisor probably wasn't going, oh, okay. Like uh, you, you can go interview with this group to be a blacksmith or you can, you know, it's like the, there's no logical path to get there. It's kind of like, well, if that's what you're going to do, uh, yeah, you're going to be on your own. <laughs> totally. Well, you're totally right. You nailed it there. And there's a lot of people that um, when I when I told them what I was doing or what I planned to do, they kind of looked at me like, OK, all right, you have fun with that. And when you're done with that, then you're going to get serious and get a real job and um, and life will go on. But uh, I never quite went there. Just, uh, stuck with stuck with the blacksmithing and things that that just made me tick well which has been 27 years and was there a time along the way when you thought I'm not going to be able to make this work yeah uh, yes absolutely yes. yeah yeah there's a um especially early on it's just hard to make money right uh, and if you if you can't you know, pay your bills, then you got to figure out, well, how am I going to do that? You know, what's the, what's the next way to do it? But everything always seemed to, um, to work out. And, um, you know, it, uh, I think after the first you know, six years or so, I was pretty much set in my ways on, on knowing that this is the profession that I had chosen. And I was happy with uh, continuing on with it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with my choice. Did you, what, what kept you going during those difficult, you know, during, when you're like, oh, I'm not really making any money. I might have to, you know, pick up another job or do something else or, yeah. or whatever. What kept you going during those times? The art. The art. The artwork. Yeah. Um, because that was, um, that was something that I could, 
nobody had to tell me what to do. I could, I had a um, challenge in front of me. And if I could um, accept that challenge and um, create something that I was proud of, then that was enough to um, be happy and, and move on to the next project. You know, even if I wasn't getting paid for it, it there's still a lot of um, gratification in building something that, uh, that nobody had ever built before, whether it be something small and inconsequential or something that, um, you know, lives on today, you know, as, as a piece of artwork in a home that, uh, that I can be proud of. That's awesome. That is, because that's always the big question for all of us, right? I mean, it's kind of like you have a dream, but chasing down that dream, you, you run into a whole lot of challenges. And then how do you keep going when it gets difficult? Because you see it 27 years later and it's like, oh, well, this is what he does. And it's like, well, this is what he does because he created the business to be able to do it yeah. as opposed to, you know, here you go. This is a profession. Go, go, go do it. <laughs> yes. you, you can make it into whatever you want to make it into. I mean, uh, there's a lot of people that uh, blacksmith is a hobby and, um, and that's fantastic. That's great. Um, but I, my goal was to bring it to that next level, try to um, make a living out of it. And, uh, luckily, it's, it's worked out. Oh, it's awesome, Ben. And I mean, I just look at you and go, wow, that is, that is so cool. I mean, it's so cool kind of what you've created as a profession, as a lifestyle. And, uh, you know, as, as somebody who's in pursuit of beautiful and fun, uh, those seem like some pretty decent pursuits to me. Yeah, I, I don't know what else there is, really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. This is this is just so cool for me to have an opportunity to talk to you and to to re relive some of those times and learn about learn about what you do, learn about a bit more about Steve and how Steve helped push you in in this direction and uh, you know and just just all that great stuff. So thanks so much for joining us, Ben. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Chris. I love you like a brother, man. That's exactly it. Love you like a brother too. That's for sure, Benny. And, and for all of you, thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, the greatest compliment that you can pay us is to like us, to follow us, uh, you know, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find your podcast. But the other great thing that you can do for us is tell your friends, tell your friends that we have cool people with doing interesting things. They are experts in the experience of being human. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us. Please subscribe to Chris Waddell Living It for more stories on the adaptive community, the Paralympics, artists, athletes, entrepreneurs, experts in the experience of being human. Also follow us on Spotify, Apple, Facebook, and Instagram. I look forward to seeing you next week.